Welcome to the transport seminar uh, at McGill. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to welcome uh, today uh, Professor Karen Lucas. She's a professor in uh, human geography at the School of, uh, in, uh, of Environment, Education and Development, SEED, at University of Manchester. She has more than 20 years of experience in, uh, in social uh, research and transport and mobilities, and she applies variety of methods and if you haven't read her papers then you're missing a lot because uh, she always inspires me with her writing and her amazing thoughts and ideas and it's always lovely to, to, to hear her talks and hear her ideas and if you're not following her on Twitter then you're missing a lot as well. <laughs> so, uh, thanks Karen, thanks for coming to, uh, to us, it's uh, really a pleasure to have you and you can start sharing your screen and start the talk. That's lovely. Thank you so much, Ahmed, for inviting me. So uh, I'm sharing my screen now. Hopefully this will be okay. Okay? Yeah, okay for everyone? Think. Yeah, great. So today I'm going to be talking about some work that I've been doing over in about three years in relation to transport equity in global south cities. I'm sorry to say with uh, predominantly a focus on uh, um, African cities and Asian cities and not Latin America, because I can see that some of the people are in the room um, are, are from uh, Latin American um, countries. So I think some of it's relevant nevertheless. I think you'll find, but I think that the situation is possibly quite different there also, but we can perhaps discuss that later. So I'm having problems to move this okay maybe that okay so um yeah so i think uh, just a quick background to the rationale for my research which is pretty much always the same which is that of course transport is seen as a key component of um, economic environmental and social well-being um, and especially in rapidly developing cities where often transport interventions are seen as some way to uplift and upgrade the city um, but actually, quite often, um, we still find in those cities that a large percentage of journeys, and this would be perhaps a, a bit less of a percentage in Latin American cases, but, but you know, in um, many African cities and Asian cities, 70% of all the journeys are still on foot or non-motorized, um, but they're undertaken in very dangerous and polluted and, uh, environments. Um, and there is a fundamental lack of access to good transport services and resources, particularly with low income populations. And this means that they're often excluded except from the ex access to uh, key life supporting activities. And I write about this a lot in many contexts, and I think it's pretty well founded with the empirical data now that this is the case. Um, all over the world, not just in global south cities, but it's obviously more intense, more deeply embedded and um, more severe in the case of um, developing cities, global south cities. Uh, another phenomenon which perhaps is less often in the global north is that because so many new transport systems are going, off, are going in, um, but they're not, uh, they're often not taking, not just not taking account of the travel needs and financial circumstances of the poorest people who don't have um, have access to transport currently and could do with more transport interventions, but actually they're often making things worse for them through things like severance, uh, through the middle of the city, um, increased uh, pedestrian accidents because of the design of those roads and increased um, air pollution and noise pollution because they're predominantly designed for um, motorised modes and, and to the exclusion of other modes. Um, but actually what's interesting is that there's huge social development programs going on within these cities at the same time. And this issue of transport poverty, although it's so connected to people's livelihoods and well-being, is almost absent from the social policy agenda. And so when you look at some of the social development goals, you see that transport is seen as one thing and other aspects of social development are, are kept separate from that in most instances. And I will talk a bit about more about this later. So one of my big quests for anybody who has followed me is to know that what I've been trying to do is see transport as a social issue, mobilities and access, uh, key, key links to uh, livelihoods, human health and well-being, and therefore an issue for social justice. Um, and as I said, I referred to earlier, the S Sustainable Development Goals, if you actually go through them, and I used to joke 
that uh, life below water was not something that transport had anything to do with in terms of transport poverty and inequalities. But since I've been visiting some of the informal settlements and slums around the world, I realised that quite a lot of the time they do spend their sort of life underwater because of flooding issues. And therefore, transport is even related to life below water in that case, although I don't think it's the sentiment of this particular uh, uh, Sustainable Development Goal 14 being a bit facetious here, but actually across many of the um, goals, such as uh, reducing poverty inequalities, gender inequalities, but also improving um, health and educational outcomes and um, a, a, an investment in industry, all of them have this transport accessibility function within them, as does, of course, clearly climate action, um, and also issues around peace and justice in, in many conflicted areas. There are issues around um, the, the, uh, the ac access to different resources, one of them being transport. And definitely thinking about partnerships is a key element of trying to improve this situation. So what I'm saying is, is that although there are some transport um, issues woven into some of the goals, like good health recognises uh, accidents and safety issues with transport, um, in fact, you could articulate that trans, a, a transport role in all of those goals. And I think that we should increasingly be uh, targeting our research and our research findings towards that understanding, that social understanding of what transport both does in terms of uh, negative outcomes, but also in terms of what it could do in terms of changing the situation and positive um, outcomes within those delivery goals. <clears throat> So I've um, been working with um, quite a few uh, of my colleagues whilst I was at Leeds on issues around transport poverty, transport disadvantage. We have all these different definitions, but what we were trying to argue here was that transport poverty um, is, a broad, is a broad definition which includes transport disadvantage, but goes beyond that. So it's not just about having no transport options. Um, and the physical condition and capabilities of individuals to use the transport options that are available, but also where um, transport is planned badly and doesn't uh, give the accessibility function for people to meet their needs. Uh, there's obviously the affordability issue around thinking about weekly spend and whether people, um, particularly those below um, official poverty lines, are actually able to afford to, um, to, to pay for fares. All of these issues apply to Global South and Global North, north contexts. Um, as I said before, just the severity and depth of the problem is, is different. Um, there's also the issue around excessive amounts of time traveling and time poverty. And this is particularly severe in lots of Global South contexts, particularly, I mean, in Latin America too, but also in African countries and India where uh, certain groups of people are spending up to 10, 15 hours a day traveling, which just seems crazy. How they, how they sleep, I don't know when they also have to work. Um, but traveling very, very long distances in, in both directions to be able to uh, service their, their accessibility needs. And what I've already referred to travel conditions of being safe, dangerous, polluted, unhealthy. But also this final thing, and I will come back to this later on, which is this, and I've actually added it, added this sixth dimension to the publication that I've cited there, um, that this inability to participate in uh, taking taking action over the problems of transport because of the way that transport decision-making processes are shaped. And we'll come back to this, um, this a bit later. And this is the thing that I, I tweeted. I'm hoping to, to try some new concepts out here with you guys and, and have, have some of your thoughts. So uh, I'll, I'll rapidly move on. So uh, this diagram is extremely familiar to a lot of people that follow my work that I try to make the difference between transport disadvantage, social disadvantage, and that there becomes some sort of crossover. I'm not going to spend an awful lot of time on this, but I'm starting to move beyond this notion of transport disadvantage, transport exclusion, um, transport related social exclusion, and starting to think about transport exclusion, uh, which I'll come to. So I've been doing a series of case study research, initially through, through this Interlink programme, International Network programme, initially in three case studies in Africa and one in Southeast Asia. Uh, then variously, we've been adding on case studies and always open to undertake more um, case studies and spin-off projects of which some of them are listed here. So we're very much about being a network 
where I don't have to be the central person and, and lots and lots of other people are involved in putting together this research base. We're using an action research uh, methodology, which actually means that you start off with as many of the stakeholders that you think can change the situation, as well as the people that are experiencing transport at disadvantage. You get them all in the room so that you co-own uh, the outcomes. You support um, multidisciplinary perspectives, undertake lots of desk-based uh, studies because key decision makers really, really uh, need a, an evidence base before they will act. And actually putting this evidence base together is something that um, is, not, is, is a big challenge within the context of many global South cities where data isn't collected and certainly uh, non-quantitative data is, is not particularly um, accepted either. So there is this thing about moving from research into action and um, we're working with a lot of agencies on the ground, both um, in the voluntary sector, but also in the public, uh, public policy sector um, so that once we've provided this evidence base and mapped the problems, we can then build capacity locally to, um, to come up with an action agenda, which hopefully if we've co-produced it, everyone feels they own. And the final thing is about evaluating the outcomes because so often many small projects go forward that do amazing things, but we don't have the research to um, say what they've done. And so that's a really important part of the research as well. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the case studies because I've done this in many forums before and I'm sorry I've just got noticed a spelling mistake I'm noted for my typos I'm really bad at typing sorry about that <laughs> but each of these case studies has focused on mobility needs of different groups and young people and each of them has come up with what I consider to be something that is a form of um, what I'm going to now start calling transport exclusion okay and we'll come back to what I mean by that in a minute uh, so in, um, in Nigeria, we particularly went and looked at Makoko uh, slum development because there was a lot of issues going on at the, at the time about the fact that the settlement would be moved from the city centre upstream and that that was going to cut people off from their markets and their economy and livelihoods. Uh, but also we found out that the, nobody in the community is allowed to leave the community at night, which was also quite a strange thing. Um, in Dhaka, very much we focused on the needs of women working in the garment factories and found that although they make up about 80% of Dhaka's economy, um, they're basically seen as people that shouldn't be seen. And so that's quite an interesting um, sort of form of transport and public realm exclusion. And then in Kampala, we were particularly looking at um, the sort of housing and urban planning realm, but also while we were there became very clear that because there's no uh, effective public transport, we have these motorcycle taxis that are bidding up in lots and lots of different um, countries and taking over the public space and making it very dangerous for anybody else that's uh, walking or cycling. Um, so I'm sort of just a couple of examples, but I think you could pull out all sorts of different things. And so this is uh, where I'm deciding that I'm going to move and you'll have to uh, forgive me. I'm going to spend about 10 minutes on this. I think we've, I've got about 35 minutes. Is that that's correct? Is it? Yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just going to sort of say, I think that we are actually, when I'm starting to look at these case studies, I'm stopping thinking about transport poverty, which seems to be this sort of, um, you know, condition that people find themselves in. And it's sort of like a helpless condition and it's all associated with disadvantage in other areas and so forth. And actually start talking about transport exclusion, which my, by my own definition and working definition at that, is actually something to do with a systematic denial of mobility resources. And so that actually it's part of something that is, is visited upon people, much in the way as the social exclusion unit um, in the UK identified that public policies and planning were actually um, systematically denying people from life opportunities. I'm suggesting that this is happening, this transport exclusion is happening in the context of Global South cities. Um, and, and I'm quite interested when I'm thinking about this in, in issues around sort of Foucauldian ideas about biopower and the right to live and let die and who we actually valorize and value within our communities as we plan our cities. Uh, and the fact that there's certain groups of people that um, are now um, almost like inherently within the planning and policy system being designed out of transport planning and out of the city. 
And although I, I would I would sort of say that this is not entirely a product of transport policy making, but actually also a massive product of other areas of decision making around space in the city. So things to do with land use planning, but also to do with housing decisions about both informal and formal housing, um, and what what's to be done in terms of the informal housing sector, whether to uplift those properties where they are or whether to move them to somewhere else uh, where they might therefore lose their livelihoods and, and be excluded from other activities, often at the edge of the city where they have to travel further, but where the transport resources are worse. And I think that, you know, by now we have enough evidence and enough knowledge within um, the transport sector to know that these uh, effects, these byproducts are systematically happening. And we have an evidence base to say, look, you can't be doing this with low income people because basically the more that you move them out to the outside, the more vulnerable and disadvantaged they become. But there's no actual evidence that anything is being done to reverse this, this um, uh, problem. Also, I think at the same time, of course, we do know that all sorts of changes in the economy and the structural changes in, in our uh, economic systems, such as feminization of the labor force, which is now becoming much more prevalent in global South cities and other, other processes, structural processes are also not helping this situation. And that therefore the transport sector is often playing this catch up, which is a never ending game. But nevertheless, I think that also transport planning policies um, I are actually partly culpable for this. Um, I'm sorry, I'm reading from my notes here a bit, but um, you know that actually there are underlying decision values within the transport sector uh, and processes and mechanisms that are making us valorize forms of transport that are not appropriate for uh, meeting the needs of the majority of people living in global South cities and often are, as I was saying before, um, excluding them. So every time we build another road, where the majority of people don't have a car, we basically valorise uh, a certain set of, of, of values about who should and shouldn't be included within the transport system. Every time we build that road where the only um, space for pedestrians is uh, stuck on some back way where there's no pathway, where it's not pedest pedestrian friendly, where it's not motorised, where the speeds are too fast, where it's cutting through central activity areas in the middle of cities. Every time we do that, we systematically exclude the same group of people. We systematically are planning out certain citizens within that city. Um, and basically what we're doing is catering for new middle class elites uh, for their, their sort of uh, wish to be able to have some sort of unfettered transport freedom uh, to use their private cars in a way that we already know is not sustainable in the global north context and where we're trying to absolutely do the reverse. So we are putting on to these countries that are developing neo-colonial, post-colonial, however you want to do it, values that we ourselves are almost rejecting by now and saying that this is not um, that this is not acceptable behaviour. So at the same time as we've got these sustainable development goals being put forward as the way ahead for developing cities, we're actually selling infrastructures, technologies that are completely going in the counter direction of those sustainable development goals in very many areas, particularly these ones of reducing poverty and inequality. And so I'm, I'm not going to take that any further. Um, but I'm, think, I'm thinking that I, might, I'm, I'm, I want to start arguing these things and I want to start using the case studies that I was given and many, many more to show ways in which different groups of people in different contexts are being systematically um, uh, having this transport exclusion uh, and experiencing transport exclusion. I think I've got it to go up. I think I could. So this is um, further information. Uh, some literature that I've published in this area that you may be interested in that's relevant. We've um, also been funded by the uh, Volvo Research Foundation a couple of times and there's some new reports um, that I tried to visualize on here and put the link to but in actual fact it was very very difficult to do so they're not that they don't seem to be very uh, transferable from from downloads. So, but if anybody wants to find out more about this, you certainly can. Um, this is my new email address. Um, we still are running the uh, International Transport and Accessibility in Low Income Communities Network, Interlink, 
from our Leeds website. That might change um, soon. Um, you can tweet uh, on Interlink, um, at Interlink, and you can tweet me, and I should have put that up, at Dr. Karen Lucas. So D-R-K-A-R-E-N-L-U-C-A-S. Um, yeah, and I'm quite a lively tweeter, I think. We try to put things out there. So I think that's probably it from me. I hope it wasn't too brief. I can go back to some of the slides if you want me to, but I think perhaps open it up for questions, if that's all right, Ahmed. Yeah, thank you so much, Karen. Um, I, I have a question for you, um, comes from James. Um, we, so when we say um, transport poverty, do you think we might need to start switching to or changing to say access poverty since we are not, because when you say access poverty, you might be including land use. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, this was one of the things, in fact, in that paper, we do address this. So this paper is with also uh, Giulio Mattioli um, and uh, some PhD colleagues from uh, Leeds University. And yeah. we do actually argue this. We do sort of say, you know, there are all of these different definitions about mobility, poverty, accessibility, co poverty, transport poverty and we were trying to sort of draw out what different things were and that they've all they're all quite nuanced and I suppose it's within that debate that I'm now beginning to say I'm thinking beyond transport related social exclusion which is something where transport excludes you and thinking about transport exclusion which is something different to that so yeah I mean we could refine these um, definitions and I've definitely seen people like Carol Martins writing about Martens writing about mobility poverty and accessibility poverty and and making that quite um that, that's right and i think that the point you're making is that um, we should be able to see how far is this to do with other systems like land use planning and housing and service delivery systems like where we put our hospitals where we put our schools how we plan our cities and how much is that um, an actual transport problem where transport has to think about the ways in which it's it's excluding people um from, from itself. So I'm sort of seeing transport exclusion as different, if you like, to accessibility poverty or ex accessibility exclusion. Part of the same system, but di a different facet of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So questions are tickling in, so I'll start reading some of them. So um, Roger uh, is asking, have you looked about safety concerns of pedestrians against motorist transport? And he yeah. talks about his personal experience in Kampala and how motorbikers uh, rarely observe the road signs. Absolutely. And this is exactly what I found in Kampala. And I thought that Entebbe was a bit better than that, which is the, the um, city by the airport. Uh, I thought that the motorcyclists were a bit better um, behaved and scrutinized there. And it doesn't mean that you can't have motorcycle taxis as a form of transport and that it could be done safely and uh, responsibly. But certainly in Kampala and many other cities in um, Uganda, you do see, well, and not just Uganda, but many cities, um, you do see this thing of um, the, the, the ignorance of the rules. And I couldn't believe it going through the center of Kampala and this beautiful new road had been built and it had pedestrian crossings on it and lights and everything. And it was wide and it was wonderful. And basically the, the, the motorbike taxis didn't even stop at the, the pedestrian crossing. So, you know, infrastructure is not everything. You also have to have this um, supporting uh, social infrastructure whereby you can make sure that people are penalized for incorrect behaviors and that people are using the roads. I mean, the, the motorcycle taxis in, in Kampala were riding up the pavements. They were riding across shop fronts. I mean, they just didn't care. They just do what they like. And that's not to say that everyone is in that situation, but uh, and doing that because there are some companies that are doing sort of responsible uh, motorcycle taxi driving, but the general situation is one of lack of control over the system. It's a transport planning issue, you know, not an infrastructure issue. The infrastructures were there. Uh, Julian um, is asking. Uh, he, he's looking for good examples. So you have you have done work in many global uh, c south cities and many regions. So which regions or which uh, place you have went and you have seen that people have actually included um, uh, equity aspects uh, or transport inclusion in a good way, like a case study that you have looked at or you have seen, saying like. 
yes, that's it. This yeah, does... I mean, you know, everybody puts up the sort of Bogota example with the mayor and Penalosa and all the stuff to do with, you know, building all these walking. And I think the point is, is that he purposefully did that in areas that were low income and tried to connect low income areas to the centre of the city. So often what you see is, for example, uh, year on year, the um, ITDP, the International Transport Development um, Programme or whatever, nominating cities that have done amazing things in terms of sustainable transport. But quite often it's just the centre of cities that are, are being treated. And what happens is that all the peripheral, informal and slum areas don't get treated. So it's not to say that there aren't solutions. It's about thinking about where those solutions happen, who they benefit. And this is why I pointed out this idea about the evaluation. We definitely need, and I probably should have put another diagram in there actually thinking about that that I have, which is something which is a more livelihoods and inclusive approach to when we do an intervention, who is benefiting from it, how many people, what do those people look like, are they the most transport disadvantaged or are we simply improving things for the people that are actually already the most advantaged within developing cities or global south cities. And I think that's an important point. And you think about like BRT systems across Latin America, you think about new metro systems, new projects that are going in. And what you usually see is that they, they benefit the city centre and the low income populations are uh, distributed around the, the urban periphery. Um. Sam Mahaney, he's one of the students taking the class. Uh, I'd like to unmute him. If he can open his mic to ask his question, that would help me. It's uh, always nice to see another face, isn't it? No, yeah, to, so, so you can see another face. And because uh, he's, now, he's now, he's one of the students in the class and he's uh, in South, uh, he's now in, uh, in South Africa. Okay. So uh, if Sam can ask his question, uh, that Hi, would Sam. Hi, Karen. Thanks for your talk. No uh, worries. But, yeah, my question was around um, mapping projects and data collections efforts, usually um, in the global south, you know, that like often they are one-off initiatives um, funded by international organizations and large donors, large donors. So I was wondering if you have any um, ideas on how a sustainable effort can be organized in collecting data in those fast growing cities that often we have a snapshot for a given year, but not like multiple, let's say multiple year um, that's data sets. A, that's a great question actually, because we've got to be a lot more nimble and cheap on our feet to try and understand the travel patterns that are going on in those areas and the travel needs without having to do like these massive household travel surveys, which are not only expensive, but also quite often really not tenable within the informality that we see within Global South cities and sort of dynamic nature of people arriving and moving around, you know, settling as well. So I agree with you. And I've seen some really good stuff done with sort of like satellite imaging and then pathways and then, and then also doing like quite low cost walking tours with um with the people that are living in places so you've got the imaging and the pathwaying and then you've got exper experiences coming up from the bottom about how people are experiencing their environments at different in different conditions maybe during flooding or at night or from different perspectives from disability or children so that you walk and talk with them but that's sort of augmented with the more quantitative analysis so you can sort of run it out uh, and I've also seen some really nice little app tools that, you know, you can get them going. I mean, some of our researchers in Dhaka went into one of the slums called Korai and basically used a, an app tool that had been developed by some of our partners in Chile um, and, and took it there. And it had its problems. I mean, it, it, there were so many problems in, in the, the sort of like walk and talk and recoding them that the, the system kept crashing because it was designed to go every sort of like 300 uh, 300 yards, sort of like 300 meters. And and uh, basically they were having a problem every two seconds, you know what I mean? So it was like, it was just like, but but there are there. And I think, you know, the more we can do that with data, with data that's informal, that's passive, it has its problems. And so you do have to validate it on the ground with people, not make too many assumptions. Um, you know, don't, I, I'm never, a, I'm, ne I'm never a, I'm, I'm never a fan of, 
solely desk based modeling I'm not saying it hasn't got its role and it's got it but I think you have to get down on the ground and it's often about just as much about experience of people while they're doing things not just travel patterns and then of course always the problem the perennial problem with doing anything to do with travel is that you it's almost impossible to collect the immobility the suppressed travel how you do that is really, really difficult. So sometimes you have to get in there with certain groups of people and get them to tell you. For example, again, with the women in Dakar or with the children, they would tell you, well, I can't go out. So you're never going to catch my travel pattern because I'm not, I can't go anywhere. It's not safe for me to go here, you know. So if you when you when you're already excluding people from a system, capturing that is difficult, I think. But qualitative quantitative mix with all the wonderful tools that we now have at, at our disposal for remote sensing and all those other things a good mix i think is the answer is that all right thanks guy uh, uh i so i want to take you back to some of the uh, details Can I just add one thing yeah. but with all the data in the world it doesn't it's no use unless you do disaggregated analysis so that's the other thing. It's like you have all the data, but it's how you analyze it. And unless you disaggregate it properly by different groups and by different places, then, you know, the aggregation is a big problem. Sorry, Ahmed. No, no, no problem. No, 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 thanks. Uh, he, here's a question came from uh, about the research directions. So I want to get back to the your choices or how you made your choices about selecting cities. Aisha Ahmed is asking that you have an interesting choice of, of locations. Can you please elaborate how you selected these cities or how you ended up working in, in, in some of them? Well, I have to say that it was completely ad hoc. Basically, the, the, um, the UK grant funding body put out a call for these networks and gave a very little time for us to make the application. And so we had to work with people where we knew we already had partners, particularly university partners in strength. And we, those four case studies were the, the initial case studies. And then we built on them as we got bits more of more funding from here, there and everywhere. And in fact, the, it's difficult to describe, but this network um, it, uh, it has about 10 universities in the UK involved in it, and those universities have got their own networks, and we've been building up these case studies over time, so it's very much about where could you put your foot, you know, quite quickly and be active on the ground, so it was about that capacity issue, and so we all sort of work with known partners, um, and it must be said that it, it is incre incredibly difficult to um, sort of go in there blind. You do need those local partners on the ground that have already been working with communities so that you can get access to them and continue to have access to them because otherwise, you know, you feel like you're flying in and flying out and that's not right either. So it, it was very sort of accidental and also this fund, uh, it wasn't it wasn't focused so much towards Latin America. It wasn't for Latin America because there's a separate funding body that does that. So it's all to do with funding and where you're able to get the funding to work. But then we have partners, you know, I've just seen Juan Carrasco pop up on the screen. So we have partners like Juan Carrasco, who is in the University of Concepcion and is working with his research group and doing like parallel studies. And we're swapping back and forth and sharing instruments. So the one thing about universities is that we've got, they're global, you know, and we can collaborate as much as we like. And we don't all have to be involved in all of each other's projects in order to be able to generate the data and the research information and then share our knowledge. So I think that's that's it. So it was accidental, really. Well, a second part of her question, she was asking, as you go to these cities, like since you already have people on the ground from the local uh, uh, universities, how much is the, the research tickles up to city officials and interactions with them? Uh, in right, so that that's a really good question, because this is one of the things that we've been told is a real big advantage of having this sort of international and um, a profile from people from outside of the country, because we were all, always very worried that we'd be seen as going out there and, out, and interfering and, and not knowing our place and sort of, you know, it's very much not about telling people, which is why this is co-production model. But the one thing that we were able to do is we were seen as like special. And so you could get quite high level city planners to the table with 
communities that hadn't been able to get access to those people and not been able to get airspace with those people um, at all. And so it was quite surprising to me how you were able to have these high level stakeholder meetings. And I have to say, though, that we work with an agency called Walk 21, which is a global um, agency and also Slowcap and agencies like that that have done an awful lot to engage city mayors and sort of high level decision makers to come to the table. And they um, these these organisations are, are able to get into and introduce us to the political thing so it's also this advantage of going in there not just as researchers but but also with these other sort of agencies involved um to help us so we go from like i said research from research into policy into practice and at every stage there are different sectoral and, and multi-governance agencies involved in that and i think that's the beauty of the design um the, the, uh, the, here's a question that like combines two or three questions together. So are you, are you hopeful about the transport equity in the global south in general? Many of the same patterns of exclusion that you are talking about and some of it are already you see we see them in the global no, in, in the north in the global north and despite the vast resources we're having in, in areas like in Canada or in the UK, uh, and we still can't move beyond that. So what are your thoughts on that? Yes, I am, because if you've got 70% of people walking in your city and you stop doing the stupid things and start providing for them to walk safely out of pollution and design your city for walking, and we've all been starting to talk about the 15 minute city and all of this, you know, then I actually believe you've got much more of a chance of, of, of getting a sustained thing. So it's like, all you've got to do is take the bullet by the horn and get the minority of people to stop driving their cars through the middle of the city, right? And use more sustainable modes and sort of like properly plan the public transport and do all those other things, right? Which we're too lily livered to do in the global North cities. And we don't dare because the politicians don't dare. But when you've got a majority, you've got a majority vote. So, you know, instead of listening to the noisy voices of the few people that drive, uh, and the elites and seeing it that way, then I think, you know, we can do that. But the problem obviously is that those elites have a lot of power within those cities. There's a lot of corruption and there's a lot of other things. So I think this, this is why the people that I work with in universities of Lagos State and all these other places that we work, they're very grateful to be able to get this in external collaboration going on because we shine a light on those things we see those things and we're able to sort of note those things so and it's the things that they've been saying themselves you can't do this in a corrupt system you can't do this this way so we, we're giving sort of added validity to that within that that discourse that's how i see it so how could i not be helpful i'd be 20 years you said i've been doing this my god i killed myself if i didn't think that there was some hope right <laughs> So speaking of the vast majority, when you say people are walking, Manuela was, uh, is asking, she's just one of the students in the class, what are the locations of the majority of people are going when you're talking about the global south? So one of the problems here we see in, in North America is the, is the major segregation in the land use. And you have to go to the work and totally long distances travel. So when you say a big percentage, so are they succeeding to, to, to do a better land use mix in these areas or? No, not no. It's it's the lack of an alternative that is making them walk. And 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 you know, while we can valorize walking and cycling and non-motorized travel as a sort of preferred sustainability option and sort of make it feasible that those options can have uh, can stay within the upgrade of the city and not not be excluded from them. There's nevertheless uh, no doubt that some of these journeys are far uh, are being made on foot, but for far too long. So I was talking to you about you know. 10 hour travel, five hours in both directions. I mean, this might be a combination of the use of walking and also, um, you know, sort of other modes like informal taxis and so forth. But nevertheless, you know, there are definitely trips that need to be catered for by motorized modes and, and by planning um, a, a, a more um, effective public transport system or a public transport system at all. But that's, to my mind, that's not spending huge and huge amounts of money even then on BRT, fixed BRT routes, fixed metro routes, fixed rail routes. That's sometimes a solution. I mean, it sometimes is, it is a mix of things, but we need to think much more about what we're doing with the public transport systems and 
recognizing that you're not going to be able to serve all the people's needs with public transport because it's just too expensive and what happens in the meantime is that then they get private motorized vehicles in order to meet their needs so you know it is it is a complex mix of things but um yeah stop there okay uh another question uh comes um uh, something i want to like that's com coming from me and from jamie COVID. so speaking with your uh, partners and your other universities what are the experiences you have been hearing about uh about COVID going in the global south in general right so i purposefully purposefully avoided um, trying to get involved in surveys around COVID, post-COVID, current COVID patterns of travel, because I just personally not that interested in it. I think we can't plan for what's going to happen when we're out of the lockdowns, and I wouldn't wish to speculate without any data. So I put my hands up straight there. But what I do know is that obviously in informal settlements and slum communities, uh, the circumstances have been much worse. Uh, we know that minority ethnic communities, even in the UK, have suffered much worse. And this is to do with other inequalities, social and um, social inequalities that lead to health inequalities. Um, and the same thing happens within the global south cities. Plus, lots of populations in global south cities are not considered to be part of the citizenship of those cities and so they never get surveyed they never get included um, in any data counting so we don't really know what's going on so i'm not i'm no expert on covid i'm sorry no no that's fine that's uh that, 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 that's a decision i made as well when i was in selecting that like we're not gonna study stuff in covid that much and we're gonna study the things that we think we can study which yeah, and the like, things look, that we've always been studying, because to me, it's like, yeah, you know, why should I suddenly get into COVID when what I've really been doing is studying transport poverty and inequalities and exclusion? I mean, there's health people that talk about COVID. I, it gets me a bit annoyed when urban planners suddenly become health experts. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Transport transport planners are suddenly health experts. I, I find it difficult to swallow, really. Yeah. Um, one of the things I noticed when I was um, when I started working in uh, in Brazilian cities was everything was reversed, and we were like everything we will think about in in what I've been how I've been trained here in North America is like when I went to the Brazilian cities it's like okay no no it's sprawl and the, the 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 poverty is in the in the fringes and this and sprawling poverty. So what are your thoughts? One of the questions that came about public transport, if how can we do effective public transport where in, in Global South when you see things are reversed like that? Uh, it's interesting, but on the other hand, if what happens is that you, I mean, my, my, my PhD student, Alvaro Guzman, who is in Ecuador, in Quito, uh, now and, and has been advising the ministers for transport. And the thing is, is that if you just keep build, it's like the supply and demand thing that we, the predict and provide problem that we used to uh, think about in, in, you know, we still do actually, I think do that, is that the more that you speed up the journey times from what is basically a, a, a monocentric um, economy, and the more you speed that the journey times up from the periphery to the to the center, the more the sprawl happens and so on and so forth until basically the, the sprawl only stops when you come to some sort of natural barrier like the sea and you physically can't build any more houses on it or a mountain that's just too steep for you to do. It just sprawls and sprawls and sprawls. So the more that you're speeding up these transport things, and I think therefore, you know, it, it does become a land use issue and it becomes around thinking about how you can redesign the cities to be more accessible and to be more sort of slow mode accessible so you know there's been a huge uplift in in quito around and, uh, and other ecuadorian cities but i think that particularly around cycling and walking and improved bus accessibility and so forth but i think when you get to these massive 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 cities you have to start thinking about polycentric centers and a change in the way in which we we consider um how how the difference you know the divide between housing and uh, economic and social activities and so 
I don't see that there's any other solution because otherwise the transport distances just become untenable, which is what you see in Chinese cities, right? Where people are sort of like being pushed further and further and further out by the design of new metros, where even by metro, it's not possible to get to their jobs anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a social scientist. I'm not a transport planner. I've got no idea, really. I'm just talking off the top of my head. It's not for me oh, to solve these problems. But, you know, I, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what the solution is. I do know what the solution is for people who've got no money and live in low incomes, and that's to improve their walking environments um, and to reduce the cost of their travel and to provide improved sort of transit options. So you know? speaking of this, Margaret Ovenel is asking, to, uh, first she's thanking you for, for the talk, and she's saying very interesting talk, and she's asking to what extent our planners uh, have incentives to empower or increase access to workers and low income uh, groups uh, based on, on your work on the, because we know that the high income people are the wealthier are, are those in power in most areas. So how can- Well, so there's a difference between politicians, policy makers and planners, and you know, the, the politicians incentive might be, is probably quite different, but it can become a very popularist movement for politicians and so that has actually happened in a lot of Latin American cities where actually this issue of transport has become quite a political issue and that people that are seen politicians that seem to be doing something about it and, and addressing it head on whether that's around fair costs and riots or whether that's around improved infrastructures or whatever that has actually been seen to be a politically attractive way to go in some cities planners and policy makers i think this, the problem is is that we still have models that evaluate transport that put journey time savings over and, uh, and many people say this put journey time savings over improved accessibility and over improved um, social outcomes. So, you know, it's like, it's better. It's much, you, it, uh, the value of speeding up a car to go, uh, well, many cars to go a few inches faster around a roundabout or whatever is something like, you know, 10,000 times more than a human life. And so you build roads that basically don't value human life and it's OK to knock people over. And then, and, you know, what value do you put on, on a human life? And if you put on it life years lost, economically speaking, the journey time saving counts much, much more than life years lost. I mean, how is that possible? I have no idea. You know, how is it possible to pollute a whole community and that that's to be of less economic value than speeding up? A whole load of trucks. I don't understand how that works at all, but that's the way it's calculated. And so, for as long as that's the way that transport interventions are, are evaluated, that's the outcome you're going to have. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Karen. It, it was a pleasure to, to have you with us in the seminar. And for those who are following us, we just uh, wrote in the chat uh, Professor Lucas's um, Twitter handle. If you can, uh, if you are interested in, in this subject, uh, she's a, a major resource of inspiring many of us in this area of research with her great writing. And, and next week we'll have Fergal King, who is a, a planner, and he will talk to us about implementing um, equity in transport in uh, Vancouver and TransLink and how he included it in uh, transport planning in the real world in uh, succeeded to get it into the plans in in Vancouver, uh, BC. Well, that Thank sounds so fantastic, much. doesn't it? That's such a good follow up because that's yeah. the thing. And I mean, there have been individuals that have done this. So I think, you know, that is the point. It's like use these examples of of getting in there and see how they've done it. And it's quite often um, because they've had somebody valorizing that. Yeah. So that's next week. Thank you so much. And it builds very well on what Professor Lucas presented to us today. Thank you, Karen. Thank Hope you so much, Ahmed. Thank you. Bye.